So, what if I want some scores that can go ahead and look at that sort of thing? Well, with our powers combined, we can talk about, and briefly, two other metrics for model fit, the RMSE and the CV. Now, comparing these, they are all related to each other. So let's recap RSE for a moment. RSE, residual standard error, we said was good for the model to predict your dependent variable. It has the same units of the dependent variable, so if you're talking about you know, some opinion on something, then it's measured on the scales of that some opinion, right? And lower units are better. RS, RSME, or, or sorry, I think I have a typer on there. Yeah, RSME is root square mean error, and it's almost the exact same thing as RSE, right? It's also goodness of fit. It also works with the same units better. It's also lower units, but I'm going to show you mathematically how it differs, how it takes into account something a little bit differently. CV is short for coefficient of variation. It is unitless, so it does not have the same units of your dependent variable. Because it is unitless, it's a standardized number, we can compare it to any other regression model, even if the dependent variable and the predictor variables used in those are completely different. All right, so we can take an apples model, we can take an oranges model and compare it. We can take an apples model, we can take a steak model, and we can compare it, okay? So the CV, the coefficient of variation, can be used like that. And therefore, we can also think of it in terms of like R squared, but what it's actually looking at, what it's actually considering in its numerical interpretation are how closely the actual values and the predicted values are to each other, right? How far apart are they? Are those residuals smaller in nature? Looking at the math briefly, the RSC has up in the numerator Ooh, this looks very similar. This should be familiar. This is residuals. Y hats and Ys, differencing, that's a residual. Residual squared, residual squared summed, adding them together, that's what we're working on trying to minimize in OLS, the sum of the residual squared. And that's what we have up in the denominator when you're working with the RSE. It's being divided by the degrees of freedom of your particular regression model, and then we take the square root of it, and that's your residual standard error. RSME, no, I get these backwards sometimes, RMSE, RSME, I'm meaning the same thing here. Root mean square error, root square mean error, I can honestly never remember which one's which. So it's RMSE. If I see a couple typos on here, please forgive me. It's RMSE, root mean square error. Right, so you still have that same formula, exact same as RSE. However, instead of using degrees of freedom, we're using n, which is the full sample size. Right now, what happens if you take all values of something, add them together, and divide by n? That's an average, or we also know it as the mean. So this is the root of the means squared error. Okay, so. The difference between these is small. There is a difference conceptually. We'll get back to that in a moment. And then the CV is the RS, RMSE divided by Y hat. So the mean of the dependent variable is divided into your root mean square error, and that gives you the coefficient of variation. Now, just to kind of bring back to this, when we're talking about the RMSE and the RSME, we're talking about root mean square errors here. You may also hear about it <clears throat> in terms of the RMSD, or the root mean square deviation, same thing. And the differences we said in the formula was that the RSE, the residual standard error, divides by degrees of freedom, RMSE divides by N, so therefore N could be considered a more biased number compared to the residual standard error. It goes back to that same reason of why when we create a standard deviation, are we dividing by n minus one instead of just n? And that's in order to be on the more conservative side of things when we are trying to estimate to the population. All right, now we have these particular metrics here. We have these ideas that we have, we have f, we have r squared, we now have rse, we have rmse, we have cv, abc, dfg, no, I digress. So, now you have these particular ways to understand how your model's doing, which ones might be better, which ones might be worse. And you're still maybe wondering, well, how do I figure out 
how to use them and which one do I do and how do I get these how do I get the predictors in order to figure out which models I need to be using. So as I said before, guide yourself by theory. Guide yourself by what makes sense. Put into the model the sorts of variables that you would expect to find we're going to help explain your dependent variable. They could be what we call primary variables of interest, these things that we think are core fundamentals that help um, explain why something is the way it is. And the other ones could just simply be control variables that are being added to account for extra variation because maybe they have relationships with your predictor variables and the dependent variable and we're trying to figure out this big messy complex world that we live in. Now the other thing you can do and for some of more of a functional approach is choose a selection strategy to figure out which variables we're going to be adding and taking out. Now, there's two predominant ways that we can do this. There are others, but in this case, we're talking about what we call a forward selection and a backward selection. A forward selection says, start with one variable, or maybe a couple variables, and add in one at a time, and go through this iterative process of add a model, see how it, run it, see how it fits. Add another variable, run the model, see how it fits. Add another variable, and so on and so on, until you find your best fit model because at some point you're going to reach a threshold in which you've added another variable and your model's not going to be doing as well as it did before. So then you're going to have to say, all right, if I take it out, how is it working? Now you may have to think about uh, the order in which you add these and you may want to try that forward selection method, changing that order up a little bit to see once you reach that threshold, are there some in there you could substitute out? It can be a lengthy process depending how many predictors it is that you are considering to use. The other method is a sort of reciprocal approach. It is the backwards selection, and this is where you just take all the variables you're thinking about, you dump everything into the model, and then start working backward, taking out a variable, run it, check the fit. Take out a variable again, run it, check the fit. Take out another variable, run it, check the fit, and so on until you find the best fitting from this reverse type approach. Okay, now this, these generally work and they're commonly used, but I wanna just give you my little soapbox PSA for a minute and just kinda go back and talk about this thing called p-hacking. Now p-hacking is generally understood as when you are doing things to your data and you're running tests over and over again in order to find just the ones that meet your p-value less than alpha to say you're statistically significant. And so yes, there's always going to be ways in which you can tweak your model and do certain things that are going to help you get that statistical significance. The same thing can happen when we're talking about our model selection here, okay? You can hyper-specify your models so you are always finding these sort of significant effects because you're choosing certain predictors that are going to make others more or less statistically significant and take them in and out. So just keep that sort of thing in mind, just sort of in the back there while you're working through these, these processes. I want to go ahead and close out with a, a brief example here so we can see a little bit of this in action. And so we can ask ourselves uh, an example question here. How does one's perception of their financial standing, their fear of walking alone at night in their neighborhood, and their gender affect their optimism. And in the provided script files that I'll be giving you with these video lectures, uh, we're going to be using the General Social Survey 2016 data. There are a series of six variables related to optimism. I have combined them in the script file into an optimism scale, where 1 means you have low levels of optimism and 25 means you have high. So we're going to build an, a regression model that's going to use optimism as the dependent variable, and we're going to use the ones up abo mentioned above in the question as our predictors. And let's go ahead and check the model, see how it fits, and then later we're going to add in two other predictors, happiness and marriage, and trust, and see how they change using R squared as a differencing here. So the version screenshot I have up at the top, this is where I have the regression model. And if I look at the multiple R squared and the adjusted R squared, the multiple R squared is 0.061 and adjusted is 0.58. Now note, adjusted is a little bit smaller than multiple. This is what we expect. It's penalizing our model for having additional variables in the model itself. And it's not penalizing it by a ton, but there's some penalty. If we're thinking about this in terms of percentages, it would be a difference of 6.1% against 5.8%. Not a huge difference. Just so note, if we want to also use this as an example, the residual standard error above is approximately 3.7.
Well, let's compare that to the model below it where we have the same variables, but I've added in ones for happiness and marriage and trust. And these are categorical, so they've been factored out so we can have reference groups. And the multiple R squared has jumped to 11, sorry, 0 0.119, and the adjusted has jumped to 0 .10, 0 0.104, approximately. So if we're looking at comparing it up above, it's nearly doubled in the multiple R squared. It's going from about 6.1% to about 11.9%, nearly doubling in size. Adjusted R squared also jumped quite a bit from about 5.8% to about 10.4% of variation explained. However, the differences now adjusted is penalizing even a bit more. In the first one, it went from, it was a difference of about 0.3% between multiple and adjusted. In the one below, we are being penalized by almost approximately 1.5%. So the adjusted is doing a lot more penalty, even though it has it is much larger than it was before. So our model, the second model, ha accounting for happiness and marriage and trust, is doing better than the one above it with saying how much variation is explained. If we check those RSEs, the RSC in the first model was about 3.7. The RSC in the second model is about 3.56. So it's smaller than the 3.57. Not by much, but it is. So it's technically a better fitting model. And so the second one is where we want to go. But let's look at the regression variables themselves and their coefficients for a moment and see it, how we can look at this. And so on the screen now, I have three regression models here for comparison for you. And I apologize if this seems like a lot of information on the screen or if it's a little bit small, I'll try and walk us through it. So on the farthest left column, we have a column of the different variables that are in the model and in the second part below the various model statistics. The second column where it says one initial, these are our regression uh, coefficients and the model statistics that go with that particular variable. The second one, full, is where we have added in our marriage and trust variables, and then we're going to come to the third one, which is where we're going to run a third regression model to compare it to the second. So in the first regression model, we have the variables for your opinion on family income, fear, your gender, and our y-intercept. All of them are highly statistically significant. We see that the, we have the adjusted r-squared of about 0.61. I'm sorry, our R squared is 0 0.61, adjusted of 0 0.58, and our RSE of 3.7, and so on. Comparing it to the second model, we have the same fit statistics that we had before, but take a look at something. Let's compare a couple of the variables here. If we look at the sex variable, for we said this is the effect of being female compared to male, that there would be, in the initial model, a 0 0.82 increase in the optimism scale. The full model says that's 0 0.823. So these are almost the same, very little difference. If we look, and I remove the standard errors in, in the screen here just because I couldn't fit everything on, but the standard errors would be a little important here, because on those stars next to each of these, the initial model had three stars, meaning it was extremely statistically significant, an alpha level of 0 0.1. Sorry, 0 0.01. The second model, it's not as statistically significant. It is still statistically significant when alpha is 0.05, but it's a little bit different, which means our standard errors changed. Okay. Now that means, although the coefficients are almost the same and the, we're still statistically significant, that the model's not changing much with by gender. This is robust to the variables that we've added of trust and marriage. But when we add in fear, things have changed. Sorry, not add in fear, when we look at fear. Fear was highly statistically significant. Not being afraid to walk in your neighborhood alone at night corresponded to an average one unit increase in our optimism scale, controlling for the other variables in the model. But in the full model, it's dropped to half a unit increase in the optimism scale, and it is no longer statistically significant. Oops. Adding in either marriage or trust, or both, they are accounting for an amount of variation that was previously being explained by fear, and now fear isn't having an effect on the model. It's no longer a good predictor when we account for things like trust and marriage. 
I'm going to assume it's going to be more related to trust. I don't have actual evidence for this, but if you are a more trusting individual, you might be a bit more trusting of walking in your neighborhood at night, just off the cuff thought. And so we might want to consider running a third model where we take fear out. If we don't have a theoretical reason, if we don't have a good idea why fear should be kept in, then we can go ahead and perhaps take it out. And so the third model is exactly the same as the full model, the second one, except we removed fear. And when we've done so, some of the coefficients change in response to one of the variables coming out, right? Sex actually becomes more statistically significant again and actually goes up a tiny bit. And the other variables respond as well. The trust variables become stronger than they were, which again reinforces the thought I had that fear and trust may have been related. And now if we look at the adjusted R squared, we've gone up from the full model of that 10.4 to an 11.5. So we are now getting more of the variation explained. It turns out that fear in the full model was holding us down. It was an extra variable in the model that we were being penalized for because it wasn't giving us predicted, uh, it wasn't contributing to our variation explained. So this is just a sort of model selection process carrying you through a couple steps here that I want to kind of show you how these work and fit together. And so with that part, we're going to go ahead and close out this video model selection. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.